he's made a tremendous fortune for himself, and what would be fabulous is to see him put that ability and his talents to work for the rest of us. That is Michael Cohen of the Draft Trump campaign as Donald Trump sets out to meet every person in the state of Iowa. So roughly translated, what he's saying is vote for the Donald. He's really rich. Top <laughs> line begins right now. Hello and welcome to ABC News Top Line. I'm Rick Klein. And I'm Jonathan Carl. Every day at noon Eastern, right here with the latest in politics, we are always wealthy with political knowledge. It's twitter.com slash rickkline, twitter.com slash John Carl. John, what's your first top line? You don't cut. This is a momentous day here on Capitol Hill, Rick. We have two separate votes on cutting the budget, a Democratic proposal that would fund the government for the rest of the year, cutting it by seven or about six billion dollars, a Republican proposal that would cut it by about 57 billion dollars. Here's the thing, Rick, they're both going to fail. Both of these bills will go down in flames. And meanwhile, while they talk about cutting either six or $57 billion, as you know, this year's budget deficit is $1.6 trillion. And they wonder why people hate Washington. You're going to have two different votes. Everyone knows they're going to fall short. This is just so they can have more votes later on. And everyone seems okay with it. You don't actually see a lot of protestations. People go through these votes. They call them test votes. Both sides realize they don't do it. And then they actually start negotiating after the votes. Makes perfect sense. Next up today, consequences of sin. You know you're having a, good, a run of good luck when even your retirements are well-placed. Senator John Ensign of Nevada is retiring. And actually, this time, it's Republicans who are sighing in relief. As he said, it's because, the, because sin has consequences. In this case, it's the affair that he had with a former uh, aide's wife that is now the subject of an ethics committee that had political consequences. He was going to face a very tough primary and general election. Republicans are glad to have a clean slate in Nevada. Yeah, no doubt. Look, if he had run and Republicans had no idea what he was going to do, they were certainly hoping for this retirement. But if he had run, there would have been a bitter Republican primary out in Nevada. Uh, always a tough state, as we saw last time around for Republicans. So definitely breathing a sigh of relief. Next up, O'Keefe strikes again. Check this out, Rick. This just in. James O'Keefe, uh, who, of course, brought us those acorn videos uh, dressed up as a pimp. Uh, he has now struck again with a secret video that was done with a, a, a top executive at National Public Radio, they sent in folks uh, posing as Muslim Brotherhood executives, or, or at least folks with a Muslim Brotherhood, offering a $5 million donation to NPR. This was shot at Cafe Milano. The executive uh, for, uh, for NPR is seen on tape actually saying that the Republican Party uh, has been hijacked by, quote, white middle America gun-toting, seriously racist, racist people. Well, uh, the good news for NPR is that Ron Schiller, the senior vice president, announced he was leaving last week. Today, in a statement, NPR said that his uh, his, his uh, statements were, uh, were not the kind of thing that they want to be associated with, but he's already gone. He, he also said in that tape that NPR may be better off without federal funding. It's quotes like that that uh, may end up granting him that particular wish. And lastly today, Grandpa Simpson, the co-chairman of the President's Fiscal Commission, Alan Simpson, isn't crazy about those damn kids. Of course, he's got that proposal to try to ha have some major reforms to entitlement programs. This is what he said on Fox yesterday. Grandchildren now don't write a thank you for the Christmas presents. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the enema man, the Snoopy Snoopy poop dog, and they don't like them. That is how you reform entitlements. It's taking on Snoopy Snoopy Poop Dog and, of course, the Enema Man, maybe Eminem. We're not sure exactly what that reference was to, John. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, but look, I know, uh, Rick, that uh, you always sent uh, thank you notes for your, for your presence. Always. So, uh, you know, always. The, the, no the, the culture has certainly declined. It's a shame. It you got it. We'll begin today's program with a, with a special guest from the Service Employees International Union, the new president of the SEIU. Mary Kay Henry joins us, and uh, big time for unions. A lot going on on multiple fronts in multiple states. I know it's a lot to balance, but I want to ask you broadly, how did we get to this point where you have so many states that are essentially declaring war on public employee unions? Well, I think it was when the Koch brothers and banks and other corporate CEOs that want to eliminate the ability for workers to join together and build a middle class in this country made a decision in this past election to up the ante.
But now you 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 fought really hard against these candidates who won. Uh, you, you 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 fought state after state against these Republican mm -hmm. uh, uh, candidates. They won. Now they're essentially doing what they promised they would do. What's wrong with that? Well, there was no promise about eliminating workers' voices in the future of Wisconsin, and I think what we're seeing is people are rising up in state after state to say. We want to stand for our future and our economic livelihood, and uh, that's not what they campaigned against about, because those governors said they were going to create jobs and help us get back to work, and that's what we need to have happen in this country. How is this reverberating throughout the labor union? I've seen some speculation from Democrats primarily that this may actually energize organized labor. I'm sure this isn't the way you'd want it to happen, but how is the labor union going to emerge from this, and what are the political consequences from your perspective? Well, I think it allows for us to stand with all working people in this country and say that we want to figure out a way that everybody can live the American dream and that we can own a home, work hard for a living, get rewarded by being able to raise our families, expect that our kids are going to be able to go to college without drowning in debt and get a good job when they graduate. And that it has allowed the American labor movement to join hands with the Sierra Club, with the high school students, the college students, and say, we want to be able to have a future in this country where our kids can do better than we have. But, but do you think this is something that, that's going to come back and hurt Republicans politically? Just look at this as a political question now. I mean, do, do you believe that this will, is, as Rick was suggesting, energize the labor movement to such a, a, a point where looking at elections next year, we're going to see Republicans pay the consequences of what they're doing now? Well, I hope what it does is make every elected official accountable to helping middle America get back on our feet and that both Democrats and Republicans will look for a way that we can create millions of jobs and invest in the future of this country so that we all share in the responsibility. There are great corporations in both Wisconsin and Ohio that are paying workers middle class wages and we want all of the private sector to be able to reinvest in our communities and get us back to work. Let's talk about that top elected official, President Obama. We remember him from the campaign trail saying that if people ever took on workers' rights and tried to bust unions, he'd be there, put on those comfortable shoes as President of the United States and walk the picket lines. Now, we have seen him put out an early statement on Wisconsin, but he's been almost entirely silent on this uh, through the last couple of weeks as we've seen state after state take on unions. What do you make of that? And should the president be more actively involved in protecting workers' rights at the state level? Well, our members in Wisconsin and Ohio were incredibly proud when the president spoke out about the real agenda in Wisconsin and Ohio being about eliminating workers' voice and busting unions. And that was a huge uh, step forward. We then saw the Secretary of Labor issue a uh, statement and then an op-ed and then do a speech that said that union is in her family, that we have to have a way to solve problems at the collective bargaining table. So we think the administration has stepped up in this moment and that it's up to the, us, the people uh, all across this country, to hold our government accountable and get the private sector to reinvest in America. Okay, can you just explain something to, to me, uh, a very basic question? It, it, describe for me the collective bargaining rights of federal government employees. Well, uh, they, there's various rights. I think the essence is for people to know that it's a chance for every worker to be able to sit across a table, solve problems, improve pr the productivity, efficiency in the best of the situations around the country. There is labor management, problem solving about how do we better serve the public, but, but, and but, that but, that's the best of collective bargaining. But, 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 but what I'm asking is, is, is do, do federal government employees, the, the, the employees who work here in Washington, the agencies, do they have the collective bargaining rights that workers in Wisconsin are trying to protect? Well, they're uneven. The uh, federal employees have the ability to bargain over wages, and there's lots of labor management committees. I know in the Veterans Administration, registered nurses are trying to figure out how to improve service to veterans. Um, so that it's not exactly the same set of rights, but the essential value of being able to improve the service you provide and your work uh, is the same in both federal employee collective bargaining, private sector bargaining, and public sector.
Briefly, I want to get your take on the budget fight that's going on right now. H how much can the, the, the Congress really cut, in your opinion, in terms of, in terms of the, the, the funding that's on the table right now, budget cuts right now? Is there a number that's in your mind that say that this is, this is enough or this is too much? You know the Republicans' number. What's yours? Well, I don't have a number, but I do agree that we need to cut wasteful spending and we need to think about not just a cut in cut budget, but how are we going to get America back to work? Because that is the most important ingredient to our economic recovery. And so I'm really looking forward to working directly with our employers in the healthcare industry and with government to think about how we create millions of jobs. Just like we bailed out Wall Street two years ago, it seems like we could right. be incredibly innovative as a country in figuring out how to create millions of jobs given that we have $1.7 trillion worth of corporate profit that has been mm -hmm. uh, generated in the past two years, it seems that profit could be used to reinvest in America and get our economic recovery going based on jobs. Right. All right, Mary Kay Henry from the SEIU, good luck to you, really appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks. Thank you.